cool. Um, so I, I don't really know how this talk kind of start. Actually, I do. It was uh, I was looking at open source tools that you can use in the enterprise, and it somehow morphed into how to defend against penetration testers. So uh, lately, I like to start my, my talks off with a story that kind of influenced me to give this particular talk. Um, who here has a hero or spends any time thinking about who their hero is? Just a couple of us. It's kind of a fun exercise uh, to do. And I think what sparked this question was someone asked Tom Brady who's his hero. And he said his mom and stuff like that, which is really cool. My hero uh, is my grandfather, uh, who passed away actually when I was writing WRT54G Ultimate Hacking. And my grandfather, one of the reasons why I called him my papa was uh, he's my hero is because he told me this story one time when he was going on a boat to go to war. And when they were on this boat, that was just a transport. It wasn't my, my papa's job to be on this boat. It was just a transport. Everyone was getting sick with dysentery. If you don't know what that is, like, do yourself a favor. Don't look it up. Like, just take my word for it. It's not something that you want. And not something that you want any more details other than, like, bad food makes you sick, OK? Uh, I was like up last night. I'm like, I should probably look up like the exact, oh my god. Not a good exercise to go through. So the captain pulls everyone aside. And he says, look, we need some new people to run the kitchen. Because obviously, whoever was running the kitchen beforehand had no idea what they were doing. And now, my papa being of Italian descent, although my last name doesn't say it, I am mostly Italian. My grandfather was 100% Italian, and he was like, I got to eat. Like, eating is important when you're Italian. Anyone here Italian like, can vouch for how important is eating in your world? Like, it it's, consumes much of your day, right? So he was like, I'm not letting this stuff happen. So, but being the leader that my grandfather was, he told the captain, look, he's like, so the captain's like, I need a volunteer. No one was volunteering. My papa's like, yep, I'll do it. But there's one condition. Now, I can't imagine that papa knew the captain very well. And the captain probably didn't know how much of a pain in the ass my papa was sometimes. Love him to death, most inspirational person in my life. Pain in the ass. Um, so these two are like meeting for the first time. And the captain's like, really? OK, like, you have demands for me. That's interesting, because I'm the captain, and you're just volunteering to run the kitchen. And Pop was like, all right, I'll do it. You got to give me three guys, and I get to pick the men on the ship to help me. And he was like, well, OK then you can do it. So my grandfather grabbed three people. He said, the first thing I had them do was scrub that kitchen from top to bottom with bleach. And he's like, and then I started cooking. He's like, I learned to cook for my mom. It was awesome. They had this big steamer thing. We made pasta in it. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, we used a dishwasher. We made like big vats of pasta. It was awesome. <laughs> he's like, at like 11 o'clock at night, everyone was just chilling out. He's like, I had a ham and cheese spread out, because eating is important, right? <laughs> And by the end of the trip, the captain's like, hey, why don't you stay on and like, help me out? And my pop was like, no, I got to do this interpreter thing. He spoke uh, four or five different languages. So his job was to be an interpreter. He's like, I'm doing this interpreter thing. But he proved that he was such a leader that the captain of a ship, whose job it was to get men into battle, wanted to have him on there as a permanent staff. That's the kind of leader, and the reason it influences this talk, that you have to be in order to build your network defenses to defend against penetration testers. Because let's face it, they have the advantage. The advantage you have is if you can be a leader in your organization and lead people to do the things that I'm about to teach you in this talk, you're going to make some pen testers really, really frustrated. And I know, because I didn't necessarily tell them the whole theme of this talk, but I called up all my pen tester friends. <laughs> And I was like, hey, so like, tell me about how you break in like this way. It's for a talk I'm doing. Like, They're totally thinking I'm giving a talk about like, how to be awesome at pen testing. And then they're going to watch this video and probably be really mad at me for a while, but that's OK. Um, so this is me. Um, the most important thing recently is I have uh, serious hacking days. Those that saw uh, Dave Kennedy, this was something that, that he did. And this was my serious hacking day. Maybe there, there will be more. This is my disclaimer. I may talk about things that might offend some people. It happens sometimes. Um, so if I do, the, get over it. And then, um, <laughs> so I will talk about how I did actually come up with this talk. And then we're going to talk about the practical stuff. 
um, Active Directory defenses, network and data segmentation, default credentials, canary accounts, dark space, and analyzing outbound netbound tra uh, network traffic, okay? So I tend to ask a lot of questions. So I got to ask my pen tester friends that, like, why are penetration tests so successful, Jason? Why? Uh, yeah, because you're the most awesome pen tester in the world. <laughs> right? And so uh, obviously the answers I got to that question were, well, people don't patch stuff. They use dumb passwords. And I'm the best pen tester in the world, like Jason Street, but not quite that good. And you should bow to my exploits and expert coding skills, right? Like, awesome. And I'm like, all right, I'm asking the question wrong. Maybe I need to ask a different question. So better question turns out gets you slightly better answers. So I started asking the question, and this was totally based on Jabra from Praetorian, so like put the seed in my head to start talking about these things. And so he asked the question of his own organization and said, hey, in all of our 100 pen tests across 75 customers, what led to complete network compromise? And he got a specific set of answers. I extended Jabra's uh, research like unscientifically, and I started asking all my friends. And I'm like, I asked one, I'm like, and he was like, you know, Windows authentication is really a hot mess. Um, once I'm in, I can pretty much roam free in the internal network. And people use dumb passwords. OK, we got a theme. People use dumb passwords. I get it. Uh, so then I started asking more of my friends to do penetration testing. I asked Joe McRae and John Strand. And I, I went back and I asked Jabra again when I saw him. And I asked my good friend Larry Pesci, who's done the podcast for me for going on 12 years, who leads a pen test team today. Not only was the experience based on the pen tests that they do, but their teams as well. And they all pretty much said, like, boiled down to pretty much two things. Like, authentication sucks, and no one does segmentation properly. I'm like, well, those are kind of interesting themes. I should really dig into, like, why people don't do these things and make penetration testing harder. Because lo and behold, when I started digging into Windows authentication, other than making me want to drink a lot, um, it made me think, like, these things should be easy to fix, but they're not. So I, I started asking, like, Customers aren't really fixing the critical issues. And this is something when I was doing penetration testing that I would notice, I'd say, you know, here, Mr. Customer, here is your report. You know, see you next year for your next pen test. And then I give them a new report, and I'm like, wow, there's like not a lot of differences. Like, what were you doing the whole year? Were you on vacation for the whole year? What happened? They're like, you know, like stuff and, and things and this IT project. And, you know, we have to like make money and stuff. So we had to do projects that help us make money and did nothing for security. Um, so I'm like, so why did you pay for a pen test in the first place if you weren't going to fix the things that are in the pen test? Like, you totally could have put that money to the six things that were on a previous slide that you could do to protect yourself. And I can tell you those things for free. Don't tell my pen tester friends I said that. But I can tell you those things for free. Um, so why don't people continually get better over time? And some of the themes that I get when I'm working with customers um, I'm an INS faculty member, and I talk to all of you when we're at various conferences and venues, and I interview people from the field, is, you know, um, that a lot of people will buy stuff. Like, hey, we have this problem, we got hacked, or the pen tester came in and said, you suck at this, so we'll buy something. Yeah, not necessarily the right, the right way to go. Also, what I notice, this is a theme that I'm going to come back to, ineffective communications and leadership. Yes, you as security people understand the problem. However, we have to communicate that problem to someone else in the organization to get them to do something. That, today, may not be part of their job because they think security is security's problem. Kind of interesting. So this is the wrong answer. And this is the endpoint security space as defined by that analyst firm that starts with a G. And not that anyone knows what I'm talking about. Um, but this is a lot of times people say, I, I have a problem. My endpoints, people are doing phishing attacks. They're putting malware on my endpoints. And then it's spreading to the rest of my organization. And then they have, how do they have domain admin already? This is really bad. And a lot of people think that uh, products, specifically endpoint products, are the answer. They're, they're really, this is the wrong, until you've done the six things that I'm going to talk about today, this is the wrong answer. Fine if you have endpoint protection and you're making it work. That's great. 
you still need to do those six things before you go out and seek out an endpoint protection vendor. They are not going to solve these problems for you. They are just really like it's a needle in a haystack problem for these endpoints. Attackers are morphing all the time, more and more morphing these attacks, and you're not going to be able to spot all of them unless you do some fundamental things to improve the security of your network. Okay, so commercial tools can help, but it's good to have goals and a plan. Like I said, this is some of the building blocks for making your network secure is to do these six things. And like I said, commercial tools can help, that's fine, but let's have a plan and let's do these six tips. Okay, number one. This is by, uh, by far the number one thing that everyone talks about. This could be its own two-hour talk in and of itself. In fact, when I started bringing this up with my pen tester friends, one of them is John Strand. He's like, you know, we should do a webcast. I'm like, this isn't going to fit in one webcast. I'm like, this is two webcasts. And I started rattling off the list of issues. He's like, yeah, you're right. These, and then he's like, to understand everything, you really should take a six-day class with Jason Fawson at SANS. I'm like, dude, you're probably right. That is probably the only source you can go to today that I know of where you can get all of this information. So if you're a defender today, if you're a penetration tester today or want to be a penetration tester, you're going to want to learn Active Directory, like, a lot. Um, so these, there are five things based in Active Directory. I mean, one is a password policy, which is somewhat Active Directory. The other four things are really deep, heavy, meat and potatoes, Active Directory issues. And what I found is that talking to all of my pen, because I called them all back up and I asked them about this specific thing, and I'm like, when we talk about those specific issues, I was like, so you can just like disable the pass the hash, and the answer I get on all of them when I'm like, well, you can just like disable those NBNS protocol is like, well, then there's like this thing. And then it depends on if you have this in your environment. And then, like my brain wanted to explode and I wanted to go back to drinking again because it was just so confusing to work through all those issues. I think I've distilled it down for all of you. Um, so let's try and go through it. This dude is so excited about Windows 95. I've never seen anyone more excited about Windows 95 in my entire life. He must be a pen tester because it plays into <laughs> discontinuing the use of LM, right? Stores your password, super weak format. Now, you can do a group policy setting to make this go away in your environment, but in well, the users have to change their passwords, and it depends on this, that, and the other thing. So yeah, you can do that. Now, if you do that, you will have compatibility problems in your network with things like Windows 95 and Windows 98. Who here has Windows 95 or Windows? No one wants to admit it. Everyone's like, I'm not raising my hand. No way. No way. You know, you know who you are, all right? We'll find you later. You have it in your network. But the Macintosh clients, those are kind of interesting too. So it, it can break a lot of stuff, which is why people don't do it. But you need to be able to do this in your environment. You don't want LM hashes floating around your environment. It's really, really bad. Oh, and there is a, a Microsoft help thing uh, on how to like uh, prevent that kind of. Microsoft is actually pretty helpful in having articles that will help you do this. <coughs> so use this slide, take a picture of it, go to your Windows admins, if you're not already the Windows admin, and say, hey, can, can we do this? Because this is important. Paul said this was important, so we, we should do it, right? Also, it makes their job better because it means you'll get rid of Windows 95 and Windows 98. <laughs> and Macs, yeah, it's beautiful. Everyone is Linux and a latest version of Windows. Great. All right, configure Active Directory to prevent pass the hash attacks. So in this case, obviously, I don't have to crack the password hash. I can just replay it on the network. Now, I read, uh, is it on the next, next slide? In there, I read Harm Joy's articles. I talked to all my friends about past the hash. And every time I talk with them on a scenario, I'm like, so but like, if you do this, like you're good. And they're like, well, there's like this one case if you got this, that, and the other thing. And I'm like, oh my god. So you can <coughs> disable LM and NTLM all together, right? Which essentially means all your Windows Active Directory authentication is using Kerberos. Is anyone doing this today? Anyone know of anyone doing this today? I know some of my pen tester friends, they, they've encountered networks like this, okay? 
So that's kind of interesting. I mean, that probably breaks more things than just uh, disabling LM. But the other recommendation from Microsoft to prevent against pass the hash is to implement this thing called LAPS. It's the uh, local something privi admin privilege thing, which basically, you're giving it a thumbs up. So you read the 40-page document that accompanies LAPS and did the two or three weeks. How long did it take you to implement it? couple of weeks, okay. uh, that, but that's significant. I mean, that's not just a group policy setting you're pushing out and you're done. It's a two, two to four week process from what I'm told to implement this in your network. This is, I mean, props to you, thumbs up for doing that. This is you're going to your Windows admins and you're like, I need you to like put some other stuff aside that's like making the business work. Like, Tah, you don't need that. And we're going to implement this thing called LAPS. And they're like, what? Why do I need a unique administrator password in every single one of my workstations? And you can just tell them because Paul said so. No, obviously, because of pass the hash, right? It's a common method used by pen testers and attackers alike to get into all of your systems. But it's, it's pretty comp. I thought it was pretty complicated. I don't know, I'm more of a Linux guy. But a two to four week project is not insignificant. And it's, you have to read and plan and, and, and implement it. So that's pretty much the recommendation to get rid of past the hash. It's not insignificant in your environment. So then you're like, OK, well, if, if I do laps and I'm Kerberos only, like I'm good, right? I'm awesome. And then John Strand's like, well, no, there was like this one time at DerbyCon when Tim Medine gave this presentation about capturing Kerberos authentication uh, and, and cracking the hashes. Now, what John said was the hashes are not as easy to crack, but the defenses for this really suck. So Tim actually did the research and said that you can capture Kerberos and you can crack it. And the defense is like basically he just should have put two words on the, on the slide, like you're screwed. Like that's <laughs> basically the defense for this uh, from what I surmise. The defense is, is there, but it's not very good. Um, what's interesting is like no one really knew what Tim was talking about. And John picked up on it. And Tim was getting rejected when he was submitting his talks to various places. And finally, John had to call up people that ran conferences and was like, no, like, can you just listen to what Tim has to say? So, and the example he gave was, was he called Dave Kenny. He's like, Dave, you got to, and I don't know if Dave had even seen Tim's talk at this point. John was like, Dave, you got you to you hear Tim's talk. Like, we'll set up a call and Tim will go through it. And Tim gets about halfway through and John says, Dave goes, Hold on, stop, 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 stop. You mean to tell me that that is possible? And Tim's like, yeah. He's like, all right, you're in. And, it, and Tim saw it was given at DerbyCon. Uh, and it's like a thing now, which is really depressing, because it's kind of like we're screwed when it comes to defending Active Directory. Um, so these are the two articles uh, by Harmjoy. Uh, e extremely brilliant. Uh, yes, question? Yes, you are correct. Really long service account passwords. Yes, because it, it does. Is it only service accounts that it is attacking, or is it regular user accounts as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. That's the other. Well, there's this other use case. Yeah, and that's what we get into, right? Um, so Harmjoy has some awesome posts. I mean, like everything you ever wanted to know about pasta hashing and all the nuances are there if you want to go read it. And whenever I talk to someone about pasta hash, they'd be like, so did you read Harmjoy's article? I'm like, yes, yes. I, I painstakingly tried to read all of the details in both of his articles, and my brain hurts now, which is why I'm calling you to get like the 30,000 foot view. And they're like, well, you really need to read Harmjoy's. I'm like, I get that. I get that, OK? <laughs> so I'm telling all of you, go read the articles. Now, at the end of um, Harmjoy's second article, Pass the Hash is Dead, Long Live Local Account Token Filter Policy. He says it's also worth noting that LAPS effectively renders everything here a moot point. That's good to hear, right? We know we have a path. It's not the easiest thing to do. There is a project, some communication involved, but we can do that. Yes? Oh, God, here we go with the well. There's a, <laughs> yo, but you're absolutely right. I did read that. Yes. So again, thank you for backing up my point uh, that we're all screwed when it comes to Active Directory security, which is really the point of these slides. OK, now implement a password policy. I'm sorry. I, 
I tried to put something funnier up there other than implement a password policy, which in and of itself is funny. And that certainly uh, seemed to trump it. Um, so uh, we can, uh, you can give a whole presentation about password policies, right? But uh, what a lot of people will say, and actually a lot of what I used to think was, well, if I have multi-factor authentication, the password doesn't become as critical, right? Because I need something I have and something I know. So the something I know is only part of the equation. So it's not, you don't have to have an, a 40 character password. Um, except as we move into modern technology with apps and web applications and APIs and all this wonderful technology, I run to this situation where I happen to lose my phone. Long story, it's painful, it hurts. I got a new phone, it's really expensive. Anyway, um, I lose my phone, so I'm putting LastPass back on my phone. I have two-factor authentication enabled for LastPass. And when I put it on my phone, it just says, oh, just give me your password. Ah, no, you're good. You don't need the second fact. You're on a phone. Like, what could go wrong? I'm like, I just lost my phone. I want, that's where I want the two-factor authentication. And what I've seen in the industry and what I've talked with people about is that two-factor authentication is great, except for when they just leave it out for convenience, such as on a mobile application. So you can have a really great multi-factor authentication scheme going, except when they put the mobile app for whatever service it is, it, it doesn't ask them. It doesn't ask them at all. Question? Yeah, no, there, and that's why I didn't spend a lot of time, because you're absolutely right. Uh, the question was, what's the minimum length? Um, I would say over like 15 characters or more to get around some of the, the, the issues with the that previous hashing, depending on what you're using because of all the backwards compatibility. You know, outside of that, you're right. It's, I mean, two, uh, yeah. Are you an Active Directory admin? No. Okay. Okay. You're doing good. You have another question. All right. I'm. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So 14 is the max. 14 is the highest. The highest minimum. See, we're all screwed, because I like to go one past the highest minimum. <laughs> Good Lord. Yes, but the minimum, yes, yes thank you. Um, so those are some of the gaps with uh, two-factor authentication. And we just had a great discussion about minimum password length. So thank you for that. Um, the other problem is, so basically this can be surmised as software trying to be really helpful, right? So if I can't find the proxy server to be able to browse the internet so I can go to YouTube and watch videos of Jason Street and stuff like that. My network in Active Directory likes to be helpful and give me some kind of automatic proxy discovery, right? If, let's say, I connect to a website and it takes authentication or a file server that takes authentication, the protocol likes to be really helpful so that I like send my credentials to places so that I can authenticate and it's trying to be helpful. It turns out trying to be helpful in these situations goes into all these technical details and all these protocols that essentially means that my password hash is going across the network in some kind of hashed format depending on the configuration and a number of different things. Uh, it can be LM, it can be NTLM v1 or I think even v2 over the network in this case, right? and using a tool called Responder and a bunch of other things. This article from Praetorian is probably the best one that I've seen that walks you through both the attack and the defense for this. I thought Jabber did a nice job with that. He does really good. This one is also good on this topic. It's like the number, like pen testers now. Like you used to think they get on the network and they do poor scanning and vulnerability scanning. No, they just come into the network, they run Responder, they grab a bunch of hashes and then they're breaking into all of your stuff. That's like the dirty secret now in pen testing is that really they're just uh, exploiting this particular vulnerability. Not necessarily the WPAD vulnerability where if you create a DNS entry, um, someone can't step on it, but using these other uh, legacy and newer protocols that are essentially exploiting the fact that software is trying to be helpful so that you can log into stuff. So um, that is, these two articles uh, talk about the defense to that, group policy again, to turn that off in your environment, that's something you're going to want to test. That's also another project that you're going to want to tackle um, with your Active Directory environment. 
it does, especially NetBIOS naming service, right, have the potential to break some backwards compatibility with other Microsoft operating systems. So, um, okay, so this is the protection against Mimikatz. Many of you are probably familiar with the in-memory uh, attacks. This is, uh, well, again, this is the well, but, so you can do the um, 287.1997 and put this group policy slash registry change in place uh, or use group policy to make the registry change in all of your systems. But the problem with that is the well but is that if I gain admin rights to one of your workstations, I can revert that change. And oh, by the way, reverting that change doesn't require a reboot. So if I'm an attacker, I gain admin on one of your systems, I revert the change, then I have to wait. I don't need to, it doesn't need to be an administrator of that machine. An administrator just needs to log into that machine, then their credentials are stored in memory, then I can use Mimikatz to extract them. So while there is a fix for this, uh, there are limitations to the fix. Good? You good? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Interesting. So it, it, apparently this fix doesn't work on Windows 7. In certain circum, well, but okay. That's good feedback. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that is the, the group policy. I mean, those are like the critical five things that I think everyone needs to do in Active Directory. We've already heard from people in the community that are like, yeah, but there's like this different thing. These things are not easy. Um, it requires planning. It requires working together as a team with your Windows administrators. I can tell you that I could probably stop the presentation right here, and you would stop most pen tests. I mean, not Jason, because Jason's like hiding under your desk. You're like, <laughs> but I, I did all those things Paul said, but Jason's still under my desk. Mo most pen testers would like stop and just want to cry, like right here at this point. Okay, so let's go on to network segmentation, um, which is kind of interesting. So. This comes from the analyst firm that starts with a G. And I just want to point out their advice, or someone's advice, not the analyst firm that starts with a G, on network segmentation. Are you ready? OK. Don't over-segment. OK, that's good. Good advice. Don't, you shouldn't over -segment. And don't under-segment either, because that's, that's bad. That's bad. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. That's fantastic. <laughs> I'm like, I, I want to try and do better than that. And now I'm sure this article, in all fairness, like goes into more details. Let's hope it goes into more details than that. But I wanted to go into a little more details about network, network segmentation. So this is what I deem the wrong way, and this is oftentimes how I see network segmentation, is we take these blocks of systems and we put them in their own networks, right? Like, you're not done yet. That's just networking. That's not segmentation. And we've got like wireless networks and remote offices and conference rooms and printers in one segment. We got like our Windows stuff in here, like the important stuff like Active Directory and DNS and DHCP. And then like we had this vulnerable stuff. There was a bunch of stuff that was just so vulnerable, we had to put it all by itself. Like put it in the corner, <laughs> shove it over there. Like no one will see this, it's, it's fine. And then IT administrator workstations. And then I got like all this Linux stuff. I don't know what to do with that, so I'll just put that in a segment. That's good. And then I got like all my user stuff uh, in desktops and printers, right? So then I, I connect this all to the network and I put it in through a firewall, and that firewall just allows a bunch of stuff in a bunch of different directions, which means as a pen tester, when I was testing a security company and got into one of their IT, uh, networks, I was able to exploit a pathway into their IT administrator workstations because they needed that to exist. So this is where people fall down with network segment because this can get really complicated, right? So my suggestion is to simplify, okay? And start with something simple. Um, I should have made this box red or some different color. Pretend this is a different color. All your user stuff, desktops, and printers, enable the local firewall on the systems. There's really no need for desktops to be able to talk to each other. We good? We good there? OK. There's no need for desktops to be able to talk to each other. And killing that lateral movement right in your user desktop segment, awesome. Like you're on the way to network. I mean, that's not really network. It is segmentation, micro segmentation in that area. By all means, do that. OK. Um, 
don't let anything connect to IT administrator workstations. I mean, your incoming policy for those workstations should be like scrutinized very, very heavily. Okay, so start there. Just as your user accounts in your domain or in you know Linux that have administrator access to your entire domain and all of your systems, those accounts should be protected as well. Their workstations should be protected as well. Your vulnerable stuff, like don't just hang it in a different subnet. Like that's like my, we just pointed that and laughed at the security subnet. You have to actually put some filtering rules in there <laughs> so that stuff can't connect to it that it shouldn't. A printer is a great example. There's like 8 million protocols enabled by default on a printer. I don't know why people need to FTP to the printer. Has anyone had a legitimate reason to FTP to a printer? <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. So why is it open on the firewall? Um, although there has been some research along those lines recently of people completely broke printer security, which is interesting. But um, So yeah, filter that very, very heavily. And then, like all your other stuff, wireless networks and remote offices and conference rooms and, and more, because there's always more printers. Um, don't let that connect. Like, give them their own DNS and DHCP. Treat that as a separate network. Why? Because Jason's probably done it 100 times. I did it when I'm pen testing. You walk into the space. The receptionist is always very nice. You'd be very pleasant. You put on your Jason smile. And she's like, you can go wherever you want. It's fine. I don't quite have that. I have to work at it a little harder. And then I go into the conference room. And then I actually was actually a Pony Pony from Pony Express. You plug it into the conference room. And you're like, oh, OK, see you later. And then you compromise the entire network. Like, segmentation can help with that a lot, uh, provided you do it uh, appropriately. So, OK, so this is a better, I'm not saying it's the right way. There are some tips to do some network segmentation. Your firewall rules should restrict more than allow um, between these. And if you draw these much more simpler delineations, your life will be a lot easier. Now, if you want to go like full knack, like props to you. I mean, there's probably uh, in Black Hills Information Security, I like I prepper John with questions. He gets really tired of me asking for statistics. I'm like, so how many of your pen tests like have a knack solution that's built in and it like really slows you down? He's like, like like one percent, less than one percent, which is kind of interesting. It just goes to show you how hard it is to do that in the environment. But that is another solution as well that can help to this network segmentation thing. And it's something that slows penetration testers down. OK. Discover default credentials. And I really think, and I, I kind of have proof that I, I might be one of the only people like really truly thinking about this problem. Because when I Google search, I, I, I find my own articles. I'm like, no, I want to find other people's articles, not my own. Um, so I got to thinking about default credentials. And when people think about defaults, right, they're like, hey, it's a Linksys WT54G router, and it's got admin, no password, or admin, admin. And yes, we all know it has a default credential. However, default credentials trickle down into your entire enterprise. In fact, we were just interviewing Alex Horan from Anapsis. And he said, well, SAP systems, like, pretty much the number one attack vector is default credentials. I'm like, that's interesting. They exist on your printers. They exist in other applications. They exist in audio video gear, because we have some of that in our studio, quite a bit in fact. And I got this really awesome HDMI router. I mean, it's a router, right? So I can take eight inputs, eight outputs. I was excited about that. I'm a nerd. Eight inputs, eight outputs. HDMI comes in. I can say that can go to any number of outputs. It can go to one output or more than one output. I'm like, that's awesome. I plug it into the network. It's got a network port. We should plug it in. Let's see. OK, it's got Telnet open. All right, I'm going to Telnet to it. And like while I'm doing that, look up with the default. Oh, wait, there, there, is no, there is no password. Well, surely there's got to be a way to set a, no, there's no way to set a password. I'm like, how, why would you do that? Now someone can just Telnet to it and recon. So that goes to show you how much security they've put in place uh, and put thought into for this particular device. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I, I wrote a script that is a web interface to let you know, them change the, the images on all of the screens and all of that stuff. And I'm like, it's going to be just a low, like a Raspberry Pi is going to have multiple interfaces. And one's going to go to this device. And the other side is going to connect to the network. Like, I'm not putting this on the network. Um, and it's sad that we have to make those. So not only can systems have 
uh, no password, but I mean default passwords, they can have no password too. Um, and these exist in, in web applications, um, all different types of web applications that attackers attack um, all the time and have very well documented default passwords that people just leave in place. And the more complex the project, the more likely the contractor comes in to set up, like SAP for example, and it's like, okay, you know, here it is, I've been here for a year, like you're all good, I'm leaving now. As the like, person being left with that project, you're like, you know, we should go change like, all the default passwords and stuff. Because now you gotta send the person back to fix what you're gonna break by changing all those passwords. So the default password, I think, is a, a, a problem on multiple levels for every single enterprise that exists today. Uh, so much so that once when I was on a pen test, that was awesome, when I was looking for ILO and remote management systems, which still exist today, I'm not that old, and um, you would uh, connect to the device, it would either have a default password or no password, this is the management system, and you'd connect to the console, and someone accidentally left themselves logged in as root on the console. So a default or non-existent password on your management system just instantly led to a root prompt. I'm like, that was pretty awesome. I wish I could do that all the time. It's a great party trick. Um, so the point is this stuff matters in your environment, and pen testers are gonna find this stuff. And I'm like, why aren't we finding this stuff? Why aren't we looking in our network for all of these exposures? And then I searched high and low for solutions that would detect default passwords. And I, I really didn't, I, I found some of my own articles. I didn't really find anyone have suggestions where do you, is there a tool that there was a lot of ads from a product company that I saw that was interesting um, I really didn't find a good solution to discover default credentials because here's the problem you can't just take if you have a database of 5,000 default credentials and you scan a network if I am not fingerprinting what the device is I have to send all 5,000 of my passwords to that device and likely it's gonna fall over and die or trip some kind of um, uh, password threshold and lock people out of their accounts. So I think that the real problem is not testing for the credentials, the real problem is who's got the best technology to identify all of the devices in my network on an ongoing basis and then have the hook to know which of those default passwords to send to Oracle SAP, gets these default passwords. Linksys routers get these default passwords. Paul's crappy HDMI router gets these def Oh no, wait, I don't need it for Paul's crappy HDMI router. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, and that's a manual process and also that's just web servers, yeah. And, and web applications are a huge culprit of default passwords and it extends beyond that. Um, so yeah, so you can use Nessus to do this. And I was like, great, there's like two blog articles out there on using Nessus to find default credentials. And I go to the first one, I'm like, I wrote that, crap. And then, <laughs> so I'm like, I go to the other one, I'm like, no, I, I wrote that one too. So like, I'm the only one thinking about this problem. Um, I actually, while I was at Tenemo, I was like, we should make this better, we should give people the ability to not just look for default passwords, but my whole thing was, like, I think everyone has, like, this list of passwords that you used on everything, right? Like, one of the companies I worked at, it was, let's just say it was football, okay? And, you know, the other company I worked at had this, like, this was always the default password until I said we should change that. But then, you'd get to a router or a switch, and you'd be like, the new password's not working. Oh, that's the old password. So I think in addition to no authentication, default credentials, we run into this problem where we have like our own list of default passwords that we have to check for on our network all the time because if you have 10,000 networking devices, you might miss something. Um, so having this technology is important. I don't find that the commercial products today for vulnerability scanning, and is this being recorded? Okay, so <laughs> never mind. Um, <laughs> moving right along, uh, products today aren't set up to handle this particular problem, uh, which is kind of, uh, it, it makes me cry a little on the inside, because no one wants to tickle me, I guess. Okay, so, 
Um, now let's move into a little more deception, right? That's what was before us more fundamentals. Now it's deception in canary accounts. And these are just really, this is like free, like I talk to commercial vendors all the time, and they're like, hey, if you buy our product, we can make all your other products better. And actually there are products on the market that can do that. But you've got to buy a bunch of products, and then you've got to buy another product that like makes all your other products better. This is like a free thing that you can do that'll make your products better. And essentially it means creating a fake account. And you know, this account, and this isn't a new thing, right? But this is gonna detect when someone's trying to send you a phishing campaign. And let's be honest, the number one way pen testers are getting in is with a phishing campaign, unless Jason Street's under your desk. That sounds really bad, never mind. Okay, so you, then you monitor this email for spam or other activity. You monitor the domain account for any activity, right? Like if it hasn't, it hasn't gotten an email, is someone using it to log in? Is someone, uh, is it in the logs anywhere? There shouldn't be any activity with this account because it's not associated with a real person at all. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jason. Just to add something, I've, just, I've stolen some stuff from the university of Hospital up there. Yeah. Gotcha. Did, every, did everyone hear that okay? Yeah, so you created a domain admin account. You said the login uh, uh, hours. If you don't have login hours to zero, you're going to have a bad day. Yeah. Log, make sure you set login hours to zero on a fake domain admin account that has the password in the description, and then monitor for when someone tries to log in. So, okay. That's good. I'm glad my tactic is validated because I don't find a lot written about this today. Five minutes. Okay. So we're moving on to the next topic. Uh, which is creating f uh, fake LinkedIn accounts. Now, you can go crazy with this, right? Because phishing is popular, LinkedIn is the most popular one. So what I did was, I'd read an article about how to create fake LinkedIn accounts, or spot fake LinkedIn accounts, and then I wrote these tips so like, this is how you create a fake LinkedIn account so people don't know that it's fake. So, which, because if you put fake LinkedIn in Google, like all you get is how to spot fake LinkedIn accounts. I'm like, no, no, I want to know how to create them. And they're like, well, here's how you create them to like spam people. I'm like, no, I want to know how to create them so it looks like a legit user in my organization. So I came up with my own list. Um, now, be careful with stock photos because those can be traced. Um, use your, uh, a real email address that points to your Honeypot account. Um, have other coworkers or people recommend the profile. I mean, we can really get out of control here, right? Like create other social media accounts. You basically want to create a fake presence. Now the danger is, and why I don't think more people do this, is once it's been discovered, you have to start over completely. And that stuff can be a lot of work to make it look truly fake, so. No, I would definitely talk to you. Every time I give a talk on offensive countermeasures of, or active defense in some kind, everyone always has that comment. I am not a lawyer. You should talk to your lawyer before you do anything I say, because I don't want to be held responsible. Yes. Do you have a favorite title that you like to, like, in terms of in the business unit? What is your title, Jason? Network Security Ranger or something? InfoSec Ranger? Something like that. Something fun. Um, or something related to a business function could be fine. I think, it, you know, title really doesn't matter. I don't think they're really going to discover it's fake because of a title. More so if like they Google image search your image and it's a stock image. Like something that's open in Word documents? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I love to open Word attachments. Should be somewhere in their social network profile. Okay, darknets are also not a new thing. Um, you define an IP subnet not in use. You add some routes to it. You put a sniffer on it. Or I used to actually monitor my darknet with NetFlow. That works too. Um, and don't, don't put live systems on your darknet, that's bad. People, the whole point is that there are no live systems on your darknet, it's IP space that you're not using. There's a great article uh, in there as well. Okay, now, but the darknet is just the foundation. To do some of the other deceptive things, you want some HTTP redirects, right? You want something in your robots.txt that magically redirects them into your darknet. So you know when people are curious and going where they think they shouldn't be going, you're collecting it. You want to put some fake DNS entries. DNS names that don't exist in your environment, but point to fake uh, uh, IP addresses in your darknet. Same with file servers. Also, word macros that just ping back to your darknet. 
So if you put a macro or some other kind of callback, lots of ways to do that in Microsoft Word, inside of your Word document that just sends a ping request into your darknet, you'll know that someone has opened this document uh, that is fake. You know, maybe you say it's ssn.doc, um, and you'll know when someone opens it and put fake social security numbers in there. Okay? So that's a deception technology. To kind of drive traffic to your darknet has always been my strategy. It's a blending of the deception I've talked about before with some of the darknet stuff. Okay. Now, monitoring the darknet. Uh, like I said, NetFlow and darknet data should then be integrated into your sim so that it's giving you context into your other monitoring tools, whether it's SIM, security intelligence, big data, machine learning, artificial, you know what I'm talking about. All those buzzwords, whatever you're using, you should integrate it to make it better. Okay. Now, analyze network traffic. Um, I don't know why that image is there, but I thought it was really funny. It has absolutely no meaning to this topic whatsoever other than I thought it was funny. Bask in the glory of its outstanding humor. Okay. Next slide. <laughs> um, so math is easy, and math really isn't easy, but when John Strand explained it to me, this is how we look at outgoing traffic inside of a network in our open source and commercial product that we're doing. This is completely open sourced. It's called Rita. You can go download it. So here's what we do very quickly because I probably have about two minutes left. Um, we look at four different criteria of the outgoing packets, right? So these are packets leaving your network. We look at the connection time. How long was a session established between these two hosts? And we start drawing some plot lines. And we're like, hey, you know, like this host in your internal network had this like cluster here, and it was contacting the same host on the internet with the same time uh, of connections. And it's plotted here, and that's interesting. Then we look at connection interval. At how many different, was it once a day? Was it every hour? Was it every 10 seconds? What was the interval? And we plot the interval using some super fancy smart math, machine learning type stuff. And we say, okay, well, the connection interval for this internal host to that external host has a grouping like that. Your groupings are never going to be perfect. In a network, there is jitter. You're always going to have some like scattering, but you're going to look at groupings. Then we look at the number of packets. Well, in a 24-hour period, this host, like the connection time was always roughly the same. The connection interval was roughly the same. And the number of packets it sent in that 24-hour period was also roughly the same. And then the size of all those packets were the same. And if all those factors match up, we call the host infected. Okay. Now, what's interesting is you also see this greenness infected as well. If in a 24-hour period I had one connection from an internal host to one connection in an external host, my number of packets was like one, and my connection interval was really short or really long or stood out in some way, you're also compromised. Actually, this is how we found malware in a lot of organizations, is just looking at the outliers inside of our data. Um, the other ones that are scattered all over the place, that's normal traffic, right? When you go to Google, when you browse the web and do other things, it's pretty random. Um, so we distribute this as a free open source tool called Rita. Uh, we regularly do webcast on it and talk about it in more detail at conferences. You need bro logs in order to do it. Bro is completely free. Rita is completely free. You can go to that URL. You can download it. You can analyze your traffic the exact same way that I just showed you on the previous graph, except it'll look like that. It, I believe it has column headings now. But that's basically, <laughs> that's, those are all those numbers that correspond to connection time and interval and all that other stuff. Um, and this right here is a confidence score that we build for you. So we're 99% sure that that IP address right there was compromised, okay? So that's kind of fun uh, and a way to detect attackers. Bonus tip, communication. Rather than phrasing your question to, or statement to your Active Directory or other teams, you must secure, patch, harden all these things or else say, how can I help you do your job more efficiently? Phrase it as you're helping, not making them do something, okay? And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I put that in there because that's really funny defense kind of graphic. <laughs> I think, is there another talk in here? <laughs>